Today, because of social media, we can instantly share our lives. We can laugh at funny posts, find interesting people to follow, and meet other people that like the same things we do. But what do we do when likes and follows are not enough? When scrolling doesn't satisfy? Sometimes we can have connected accounts and disconnected lives. So instead of scrolling, working, or shopping more, reach out and reconnect. Find a friend and be a friend. Someone needs your handshake, hug, and smile. Think different. Life is better with friends. We're in continuing a series entitled, Think Different. And God's Word challenges to think different about our life, to kind of take the blinders off and look beyond ourselves. This weekend, I want to speak on a subject. Now, the title is not original with me, but when I read it, I came across it one time, and it just seemed to be a powerful statement, and I'm going to use that statement as the title of my message, which is, Encouragement is Oxygen for the Soul. Encouragement is Oxygen for the Soul. I've discovered that there are about three reasons why people go to church. Three main reasons, not necessarily in this order. People go to church for worship, and we have done that. People go to church because they want to hear God's Word. They want to learn more about the Bible, and that's a good reason to go to church. But there's another top reason, I think, in the top three why people will go to church, and that is for encouragement. And sometimes the day when you you don't feel like singing a song and you really don't want to hear a message, you will go because you need encouragement. Encouragement is oxygen for the soul. Several years ago, when Denise, before Denise and I had children and we were beginning in ministry, we had moved from New Mexico to Texas because I was going to Bible college to prepare for ministry. And we, I enrolled in Bible school. Denise worked full time. She worked first at a bank, then she was working at an insurance company. And by chance, I was hired on as a, at a church. Uh, it was kind of a small to medium-sized church and to help out and teach classes and so forth, my first ministry position. And I was paid the large sum or $50 a week for about 30 hours. Just figure out the hour per uh, I, wage I was making. But I was glad to have it. And I, I, my heart was for ministry. Together, Denise and I didn't make $800 a month. I rent on our one-bedroom apartment was $218 a month. And it had that, that green uh, shag carpet. Remember that? That green shag carpet. And you'd have to rake your carpet. Some of you have no idea what that means. How many remember shag carpet? And you'd had to rake it. But the problem is the first time you step on it, your footprints would just, would just mat it down. That was our apartment. And we were in ministry planning. I was in my third year of Bible school. Had one more year to graduate. And uh, a terrible situation occurred in the church and impacted so many. Impacted the church, impacted our lives. But the pastor and his wife that we were serving for, they split up and they divorced tragically. I still remember him calling me in my office, calling me into his office and disclosing that with me. Well, he left the church, and, and that means that I didn't have a position. Uh, I didn't have a job. Well, Denise, as it happened to be, working at an insurance company, her supervisor was the pastor's wife. And that was an awkward situation to be in. And when they split up, my job ended. And Denise walked into work one day, and, and uh, former pastor's wife terminated her on the spot. So instantly, we didn't have any income. We were not making ends meet then. Have you ever had a moment when you had more month than you did income? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, the, it's all spent, payday is here, and you won't get paid till next month. But the bank account is empty, 
and you still have month left to go, and you're you're looking in uh, under the couch to see if there's a quarter here, or you're scrounging around. Uh, have have you ever taken the last bit of the ketchup and put some water in it and shake it up to make it go further? You know what I'm talking about? No, some of you have no idea what we're talking about. We have done that in order to stretch the grocery bill. Well, instantly we did not have any income. And we were not making ends meet then. And I told Denise, I had done the math. I'm just going to have to drop out of Bible school. There's no way. I can't come up with the tuition. I can't come up with the books and the, 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 uh, the, to buy my textbooks. Uh, I, I'll just go to three years of Bible college. And maybe one day in the future, perhaps God will work it out that I can go back and finish, and all of us probably have said that and never finish something we intended, but it just, it was out of my control. We had made the plan. She was looking for another job, but we were so far behind, and I just said, you know what? I can't come up with the tuition. I can't, I can't come up with the money to buy my textbooks, so in my mind, I'm dropping out. Now, somebody in the church just came up. His name was Joe, and he just randomly came up to me one day and said, what are your plans? The pastor's leaving. What are your plans? And I didn't want to say I'm dropping out. There's just something about saying you're dropping out that feels like a failure. You know what I'm talking about? So how can I say that in a euphemism? How can I put that in a way that just doesn't, doesn't feel like a, a failure in my life? I said, well, I'd like to finish if the Lord provides, you know. That, that's what you say. That's what you just say. Yeah, if the Lord would work it out, and that's all I, I, I told him. And I'll tell you, I, I wasn't speaking in faith. Faith is when you can see it, and faith is when you're declaring it, and faith, you know it's going to make it, it's going to happen. I didn't have the faith. I was already declaring, I'm dropping out. I would think it was just hope or a wish, or, or, or maybe it was a way to just kind of Cover up a little bit of the embarrassment of the moment. I don't know. I just said, you know, God works out. That's fine. But we'll just, we'll just go on from there. And we really didn't disclose anything about our situation to him. In just a few days, Joe came up to me. Joe and Claire are sweet people. And Joe said to me, Claire and I want to pay for your last year's tuition in books for you to finish Bible college. Oh, you'll never know at that moment what it meant. And what I want to say is at that moment, a man by the name of Joe, his wife Clara, they were figuratively, they let us sit in the love chair. That is to say, we didn't have anything to give. We, we, we didn't really have any faith at that time. We felt depleted. We felt stepped on. We felt used up. We felt like, God, it's the end. And we were, we were already making plans for a plan B. Then we just thought it could not work out. And Joe and Clara said, as it were, sit in our love chair. The love chair is the place when you, you're in life and you say, I don't have anything to give. Ah, I, I don't know that I can pray for myself. I need somebody to pray for me. I don't know if I can believe anymore. I need somebody to hold on and believe for me. The love chair is the point when you say, I don't even have a good word to share with my spouse or myself. I just want to throw in the towel and I want to give up and I want to blame myself and I, I feel like I've messed things up. I, I feel like I'm, I, I, I've been taken off of the list of God's goodness, and then somebody lets you sit in their love chair. Joe and Clara let us sit, as it were, in the love chair. And something happened in my life at that particular time that I have shared through the decades. I have preached it. I have prayed it. I have spoken it. Something God put in my spirit at that moment through Joe and Clara, what God did 
that I've said to somebody in an altar in a moment. I, I've said it in, a, in an emergency room. I, I've said it in an intensive care unit. I've said it in the lobby. I've said it in the parking lot. I preached on it from this platform before, and God deposited that in my heart when I was sitting in their love chair, and that's this. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. That came in my ministry, that phrase came from that moment. Early on in my ministry, I realized when you have nothing, God can step in. God has somebody that will say, it's time for you to sit in my love chair. Yes. Season in our life. Denise and I just kind of walking through a strange season. Yes. And sometimes to just get away from things and get some time away and prayer time, I get on my bicycle and I'll take a ride. And I'll just take a 10-mile ride, sometimes a 20-mile ride. I like getting out and just taking a bike ride just off by myself. Now, some of you like to go to health clubs and you sit in a stationary bike, and I tried it one time, went there, and I'm in a stationary bike, and there's a mirror there, and I told Denise, I just can't look at myself for two hours, and just, it's, it's just so boring. I like to go out and take a ride, and I have a little device that's on the handlebars of my bike, and I take my iPhone, and I open it to Spotify. I plug in the white wires and put them in my ear, and I just begin to listen to praise music. I'll be biking and sweat will be coming off of my face and on the phone and occasionally I'll wipe it off because I don't want it to get damaged, you know, from the, the moisture. Denise tells me, take care of that phone. And so I'm trying to wipe the sweat off occasionally, you know, as it's dripping down as I'm in that position. But here recently, I'm on my bike and I'm riding. And my, my daughter and her family is on my heart. And I just begin to pray for her. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And all of a sudden, it wasn't sweat that was falling on the phone. It was my tears. And something happened that didn't happen when I was perspiring, falling on my phone. And I noticed something as my tears hit the phone. Every time a tear hit the phone, it chose a different praise song. And it would go to another one. And it was skipping from song to song as my tears were falling. Literally tears were choosing the song that I was listening to at that time. And during that time, just, just, there's encouragement that comes. Encouragement that comes. I, 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 my, my friend Daniel, my friend Daniel will call me up. He's here in the church. He, he never asked me for anything. And if I'm not unable to answer the phone, he'll put a, He'll put a voicemail and he'll say something encouraging. Pastor, I'm praying for you. Pastor, I just want to encourage you at this moment. And as it were, I'm in his, I'm in his love chair. Patrick, you called me, buddy. And there are just the times you say, Pat, you said to me, I'm your brother. And I'm going to always be here. And you don't know what that meant, Patrick, because I could just feel you say, Pastor, sit in my love chair anytime you need it. There are times in life we need to sit in the chair where somebody makes a deposit in our heart, makes a deposit in our life, because encouragement is oxygen for the soul. Go with me to Acts chapter 2, if you would. In Acts chapter 2, we're in this series right now. Pastor Jonathan preached on a couple of these verses last week. I'm going to pick up where he left off. We're in Acts 2. We began teaching at verse 
42, and we're going to go through 47, but today I'm going to look at two verses, verses 44 and 45. And it speaks here of the early church, the New Testament church. Earlier in this chapter, the Holy Spirit fell. They were speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. We believe that. We believe that experience is available to you. We are a spirit-filled church unapologetically. We believe God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. Let's go down to verse number 44 and 45. And it says of the church, And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone, not their best friend, not their cousin, to anyone who had need. Now what is impressive to me about these verses, nowhere in the Bible is there a commandment, thou shalt sell your property and give to somebody else. Nowhere in Scripture does it say in the law, in the New Testament, it doesn't command anywhere. If you have, and we'll just speak in their culture of that day, if you have, if you have six goats, you take two of them and sell or, or give them away to somebody that doesn't have a goat. Nowhere does it say if you have two cars, you're to give your car away to the person that doesn't have a car. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that you're to take your couch and give it to somebody that doesn't have, you've got an extra TV to get. It doesn't say that because it's not a commandment. Then why is it in Scripture? That Bible says this is what the early church did. It's not commanded. You see, the New Testament church was not motivated at this moment by a commandment, but by compassion. There it is. The New Testament church was saying, I know it's not commanded of God. If there's no commandment given to us by Moses and there's no place in the New Testament that it's given an edict. But I, if I have extra cattle and you don't have any, come sit in my love chair. You can have one of my cows. If I've got extra property and you're homeless, you come sit in my love chair. I'll sell my extra property. And they invited the fellow believers to sit in the love chair, to do whatever is possible to minister to the greatest need at that time. The word for that, it's in our vocabulary. It's the word super irrigation. Yeah, that's a word. Super irrigation. It's known in the military, phrased this way, going above and beyond the call of duty. In the military, when somebody exercises super irrigation, they go above and beyond the call of duty. They recognize there's a medal, there's a salute. They are esteemed. That, that gives them rank. That gives them appreciation. And, and often the whole squad or the whole nation will applaud them and thank them. And here, the New Testament church, they went above and beyond the call of duty to encourage somebody else. Quickly, let me just talk about encouragement if I can. The first thing I want to say is to everyone here, we need to enlarge our circle. Enlarge your circle. Enlarge your circle of encouragement. Think different. There's somebody you work for. There's, there's somebody in the family. There's somebody in this church right now. There's somebody you're near that needs encouragement. Enlarge your circle. Get, get, get out of the box that we put ourselves in. And we walk past people and we don't see people. I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite you to enlarge your circle. In fact, I'm going to end the service early as Pastor John did last week. And we're just going to invite you to stand in a little bit. And what's going to happen is we're going to invite you to go and encourage and talk to somebody. Say, I, I don't know them. That's all right. Everybody that's your best friend, there was a time you didn't know them. Well, how do you do that? Well, smile at them and begin to do that, okay? Smile at them. Affirm them. Say something good. Don't, if they're an educator, what do you do? I'm an educator. Oh, my God, I couldn't do that. That's the worst job in the world. Please don't tell a teacher that, okay? 
Okay, she feels that. That's how she. That's how. That's how he feels. So please don't say that to them. Okay, encourage them today. It costs something because you have to go out of your way. Here, at one time I was going to Alamo Ranch, and there was a place I needed. It was a business I needed to go to to pick up something. So I went to Alamo Ranch and I parked in the area where was close to the business I couldn't park because the cars were filled up so <laughs> I parked a ways back and over to the side and I thought well I'll just go in there and come back and all across this storefront were just glass 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 business 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 and I was going to the business over here but I was parked this way so I was walking and I pastored here for 36 years and when Denise and I go out to eat and we go to H-E-B, we go to the airport, uh, wh wh everywhere we go, we meet people. We meet church folk. They talk to us, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, we, we'll meet people here and somebody say, you know what, my, my, my grandson goes to your church, Pastor. I was there for a wedding and I, people know us everywhere we go. People know us and we talk to people and they wave at us and they come over and talk to us when we're sitting here and drinking coffee or what. Everywhere we go, well, I parked and I was going to the business and as I was walking to the business, there was this man that was waving at me. Well, that happens all the time, so I, I just wave back. <laughs> I kept going and he keeps waving at me. I thought, oh, well, he maybe he didn't see me. So I waved at him again. You know, he's waving at me. So I, I, kept on, I kept on walking, and as I did, he kept waving. I, I thought, you know, somebody in the church, and is it a prayer? I need, he wants me to go pray with him. He sees going through something. I, oh, I need to go here, but I'm going to go here. You, you got to go out of your way. you got to go enlarge your circle. So I walked over there to talk to him, <coughs> just to encourage him, just to be there. As, as a pastor, he wasn't waving at me. He was washing the windows in the, <coughs> in, the, in the inside there. I thought he was waving at me, okay? Uh, and I was just waving back, okay? What am I saying? I'm saying just, just have a spontaneous heart. Always enlarge your circle. Whatever the moment is, whatever the time is, just be willing to do it. For you see, encouragement, number two, is an antidote. Encouragement's an antidote for stress. Encouragement's an antidote for weariness. Encouragement's an antidote for everything. And there's somebody here you need to encourage. And let me just say, folks sitting here, folks sitting here, God bless you, you've never met these folks over here. They really are good people. They really are good people. And you folks, you've never met these folks over here. And most of them are good people, okay? <laughs> no, they're good people, okay? It's enlarging our circle and encouragement's an antidote. It works in every experience of life. When, when you're stressed, when you're burned out, when you're in conflict, when you've made a mistake, when failure has come knocking, when you, you feel like your life is flat and going nowhere, encouragement works in every experience of life. Encourage people. Encourage people. So I'm going to invite you. Don't leave. Don't leave. Service is still going on. Don't leave. But I'm going to invite you to stand together with me right now. In just a moment, I'm going to invite us to enlarge the circle. But before I do, there's something else on my heart today, too. There are people that are in this room. Some are in the balcony. And daughters of this room, you feel so discouraged today. Online, you feel so discouraged. Maybe you feel beat up. Perhaps the news of something has come has been heartbreaking and devastating. Do you ever feel like the rug has been pulled out from underneath you? Do you ever feel like that's happened in life? Do you ever feel like that's happened in life? The rug has been pulled out from underneath you? Yeah, it happens. It happens. It 
get discouraged. Maybe you're with somebody and they don't even know it. They don't even know how you're feeling and you feel discouraged. So across this auditorium, I have put out 30 chairs here, 30 chairs. And I am designating all of these chairs as the love chairs right here. Please, please join me. Right here, the love chairs. That's what these are. And in every chair, I put a card that I printed scripture on. All week long, I've been praying about this. And in these chairs, there are no two scriptures the same. There are no two scriptures the same. And I'm going to believe the person that sits in it needs that verse. They need that verse. And that verse will encourage them. I've also put on this my email address. And if you'll email me and send me your cell phone, I'll call you and pray with you. But you're here and saying, I need to sit in the love chair. Miguel, buddy, you've just been on my heart so much. 